second Samuel chapter 6 this is an incident where David was bringing the ark into uh, he was bringing the ark and he was doing the right thing in the wrong way you see he was doing the right thing in the wrong way is it possible that you can do the right thing in the wrong way yes you can do the right thing in the wrong way the ark was being brought but they picked up a bullock cart and put the ark in the bullock cart I sometimes think about you know why some people some get ideas you know it's because of their history I'll tell you probably uh, there's no definite reason why but if you try to study the Bible then you'll get an idea and say probably this is the reason somebody had a thought like this what happened was uh, when the in 2nd Samuel in uh, in 1st Samuel chapter 4 you find a story uh, where uh, uh, Israelites and Philistines had a fight they had a battle when they had a battle uh, they were losing the battle so what these guys decided is hey now why don't we bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield you remember that they decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield and after bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield they still lost the battle the Bible says when they did not bring the, the first day when they fought 4,000 people died but when they brought the Ark of the Covenant 30,000 people died what is the strange thing the Ark of the Covenant they thought has power and this will help us win the battle now 30,000 people 26,000 more people died than yesterday yesterday 4,000 people without the Ark and when the ark came 30,000 people died that was the most tragic day in the history of Israel you know the reason that day Eli's two sons were killed in the battle and then not only that Eli was a very heavy man when he heard and you know what happened he f fell and his neck broke and he died why because he got the news the Ark of the Covenant is gone it's gone to the enemies and that is when his daughter-in-law was delivering a baby and then she delivered the baby and then she died and that boy's name was given Ichabod means the glory has departed most tragic day in the history of Israel next chapter you find the scene is in the Philistine camp in the gods and because of the ark all the heathen gods are falling down they're getting boils their their life is getting miserable there so they said no 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 their God is kind of hurt us we cannot have him we need to send this ark back you know what they did they got a new bullock cart they got a new bullock cart and put the ark of the covenant on the bullock cart and sent it on the two uh, bullocks and they had a sign if this bullocks go to the left it means it's a right if they go to the right and it means we were wrong we were wrong in bringing it here so you know what the bullocks did they went to the right side so what happened you know what they realized that this was our mistake we did a big mistake bringing this ark here so the story says God did not listen to this God did not punish the Philistines for putting the ark on the cart hear me they put the ark on the cart he didn't punish them but when David got the same ark put on the cart there was judgment and there was a death why because he was trying to do God's things in the Philistine way back up the story a little bit why do you think these guys thought you know we can bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield because you study in book of Joshua when they came to the walls of Jericho they were going around the walls of Jericho with the Ark of the Covenant in the front and they were going around every day for one circle and on the seventh day they went for the seven times so how many times did they travel 
13 times. And the 13th time that they traveled and the, they made a big shout, the walls collapsed. So people's logic is what? The power is in the Ark of the Covenant. It's because of that. So Joshua chapter 3 you find when they came to the river Jordan and the priests took the Ark of the Covenant and they put their foot in the river Jordan. What happened to the river Jordan? It split. So they thought the power is in the Ark. Get it? So all this history builds up and you say probably that is right. And because of the experience before they entered the canon, the splitting of the uh, Jordan River, falling of the Jericho walls, and then the Philistines uh, putting the Ark of uh, the Covenant on the cart and nothing happening, David thought this is the way to bring the Ark. You know what the Bible says? There was one man who was not authorized to do something. What is that? 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 6. Now they came to the threshing floor of Nacon. Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. It's a natural thing. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the Ark of God. You know what this Ark of God is doing? You'd be really surprised. This Ark of God is really blessing a lot of people, but at the same time, there are some people who are getting their death. Some people are getting a curse. Really? We'll see that story. What happened there was, in the middle of this journey, uh, David realized what he did was wrong. Okay, now see, they're traveling a big fanfare celebration going on and suddenly the Ark of the Covenant uh, stumbled because the oxen stumbled and the cart was about to topple and this guy sitting in the back, you know, he held the Ark of the Covenant and then there is a dead body right there. Now with a dead body you cannot have a celebration. And who killed him? God killed him. So how do you handle this situation? So they said, no, 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 this is not right. I think we need to solve this problem. What do we do? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 9. Now David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Today, we are going to learn about the life of this man called Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom, his house was on the way of the journey that David had planned to take the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David. As this incident happened here, the plans changed. And they decided to do what? We cannot take the Ark to the city now. What do we do? Take the Ark of the Covenant to Obed-Edom the Gittite's house. We'll take the Ark to this man's house. We don't know how big the house was. I'm definitely sure his wife definitely agreed to get the ark into the house. It is not easy to have the ark of the covenant to, to come into thy house. You know where this ark of the covenant usually is? In the most holy place. No human can ever go and see it. It's only one person that is a, mo that's a uh, high priest who goes into the most holy place according to Leviticus chapter 16, only once a year. That's when he goes inside. You know how they carry it outside? I don't know if you study this. In numbers you find this. You know how they carry it is? The, the Levites are not even supposed to touch it. The priests come, they wrap it with uh, sea, um, the cowhide, the skin, they, with different colors, and they put it on the poles, and that is when the Levites come and pick it up. They, they will not be even able to see what it is like. They've been given the description, but they don't see it. It is all wrapped up. And now this Ark of the Covenant is now taken to Obed-Edom's house. 
How many of you have met people in your life who say, uh, for some time the church used to meet in my house? Have you meet, met people like this? You know Praveen Polam? Yeah? You ask him his story. He says, uh, the church used to meet in my house. The church met in his house. You know, it's not easy. Let's take the practical stuff. I know one sister because I was a part of that church. I know one, uh, one uh, sister, uh, her name is Vandana. We used to meet in their house for church. It's not easy. People come, they, uh, they use the house as they like. Yeah, there's a big hall. They can walk everywhere, anywhere. And they all, by the time they leave, they all dirty the place and go. Do you think, you know, if you have 100 people, 150 people coming to a place, do you think it's easy to manage? How much water you uh, exhaust? How much of uh, trash around? How much of uh, things moving around? Is it not? Yes. It's not easy. Oh, is it a one day event? No. It is every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday, this, me this house had meeting in their house. Not easy. Not easy. And I was a part of that. I tell you, it is a big sacrifice on the part of Obedidim to agree to have the ark in his house. Okay. Did he choose and say, bring it to my house? No. He was not given that choice. There was no choice that he had. He didn't have a choice. But what happened there? What happened was, this Ark of the Covenant was brought into his house. When the Ark of the Covenant was brought into his house, this is what we want to learn what happened. Now, on the practical side, you see so much of negativity. So many people coming and so much of disturbance. And by the end of the day, you have to clean up the whole house every time these people meet. Now, you can't even go on vacation. You can't even plan anything for yourself. Because you are there all the time. I mean, you, you can't even think about it, right? Because they are meeting in your house. You have to be there for... Suppose the church was somewhere else and the, your house was here. You can sometimes, you know, some people think, I don't need to go to church today. I can stay back at home. You can't even stay back at home. The church is at your home. If the service is going on, you can't be sitting in your bedroom and say, sleep there and say, I, I'm not coming. You cannot do that. As long as the people met there, they were bound. The ministry started happening in Obededam's house. You know what the blessing is? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 11. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obededam the Gittite for three months. It remained in this house for three months. And you see the later part in the same verse? And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. The Lord blessed him. There is a verse in the Bible that says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no trouble to it. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth and he adds no trouble to it. There is another translation. In the Telugu translation, the second part is a little different. You know what it says? The Lord, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And in Telugu it says, it shall not become more because of man's efforts. It does not become more because of man's efforts. You cannot manipulate God to bless you. Can you? If God has to bless, it has to be that he is happy with you. And this man, Obed Edom, he had the Ark of the Covenant in his house. And the Lord blessed him. You know, when God blesses, it doesn't remain small. It goes way far beyond. It goes way, way far beyond. So when God blessed him, we know that God blessed him. And did he bless him only? 
Did he bless him only? What does it say? 2 Samuel 6, 11, last part. And his entire household. What does it mean? Entire household. Everybody in your family was blessed. Everybody in that family was blessed. The name is Obedidim. Only the husband's name is seen. You know what? The wife is blessed. The children are blessed. His property is blessed. His cattle is blessed. Everything in his house, everybody in his house is blessed. What's the reason? What's the reason? The Ark of the Covenant was brought into his house. See, he could have simply said, excuse me, no, I cannot, I am not going to allow this. Yeah? Or, or go to his wife and say, what do you think? And she says, what are you talking? You have the Ark of the Covenant in our house? No way. So you can go back and say, uh, David, my wife says, no. Or he may not say that even, but hide it and say, mm, no, I can't have the Ark of the Covenant in my house. You don't see Obadidim complaining. And what did God do? He blessed him. Alright? So, because of this, we'll see how he blessed them. He blessed him in a big way. You know, he blessed him with several generations. Let me show you that. You find uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 26. 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 4. How did he bless? You see, chapter 26. 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 4. Obed Edom also had sons. Shemaiah the firstborn, Jehoshaphat the second, Joah the third, Sekar the fourth, um, Nathanael the fifth, Amiel the sixth, Issachar the seventh, and Pelethi the eighth. You see in the parenthesis? For God had blessed Obed Edom. God blessed Obed Edom and that's why he had so many children, as the Bible says. He had seven, uh, eight, right? Eight. He had eight of them. God blessed this family so much. Wow. When we learn these things and say, wow, the God is blessing this man so much. You know, we need to learn these lessons and say, I need that blessing. Let me tell you. You may say, you said several generations, right? Yes. Read the verse from 6 onwards. Same chapter, First Chronicles 26, 6 onwards. His son Shemaiah also had sons. Who is Shemaiah? Verse 4. Shemaiah is what? First son. So verse 6 onwards. His son, right? So now, obed Edom is now becoming what? Grandfather. Obed, so his son Shemaiah also had sons who were leaders in their family because they were capable men. See, God made these uh, sons of Shemaiah capable people. Seven, the sons of Shemaiah, Othni, Raphael, Obed and Elzad, his relatives, Elihu and Semachiah were also able men. All these were descendants of obed -Edom. They and their sons and their relatives were capable men with the strength to do the work. Descendants of obed -Edom. You know how many? 62 people was blessed because of one man. One man's decision. One man's uh, acknowledging. One, man, one man's adjustment. And say, it's okay if the Ark of the Covenant comes into my house. It may be difficult for me. It may occupy a space there. It may not be easy. People may be coming and going. That's okay. Obedidim said, that's all right. Just because the Ark of the Covenant was there for three months, can you tell me how many people were blessed? 62 people were blessed. And not only that, not only that, you know what he did? You know what, uh, not only did he allow the Ark of the Covenant to come to his house, but he did one more thing, one more thing. You know what he did? Turn with me to First Chronicles, First Chronicles. You find what this man did. He uh, did something marvelous. What is that? 
What is that? Look at chapter, uh, sorry, come to chapter 26. Chapter 26. And verse 12. Chapter 26 and verse 12. You know what it did? Look at verse 12. The divisions of the gatekeepers through their chief men had duties for ministering in the temple of the Lord just as their relatives had. Lots were cast for each gate according to their families and young and old alike. The lot for the east gate fell to Shelemiah. The lots were cast for his son Zechariah, a wise counselor. And the lot for the north gate fell to the him. The lot for the south gate fell to who? Obed. Adam and the lot for the storehouses fell to his sons. Now what is so what is Obadidam now? What is Obadidam? He is now a gatekeeper in the house of God. The Ark of the Covenant was in his house. But what happened because of that? You know what happened was he, uh, look at 1st Chronicles chapter 15. Let me show you what, what happened here. We understand what he did. 1st Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 18. Uh, you can take it from 17. 1st Chronicles 15, 17. So the Levites appointed Heman, son of Joel, from his brothers Asaph, son of Berechiah, and from their brothers the Merorites, Ethan, the son of Cushiah, and with them their brothers next in rank Zechariah, Jaziel, Shemaramoth, uh, Jehiel, Unni, Alabi, uh, Eliab, Benaniah, Masiah, Mattithiah, Eliphelehu, Machnia, Obededom, and Jeel, the gatekeepers. You know what is this man do? He now became what? A gatekeeper. So what does it mean? We don't know what Obededom used to do. Now he got a new profession. That is to be a gatekeeper at the house of God. Now is it only a Sunday to Sunday? No. You get me? It is not a Sunday to Sunday job. Okay, Sunday I'll come and do this and go next Sunday I'll come. No, no, no. They're gatekeepers. They have lots. So when, when his duty comes, he needs to be there for doing the duty. Let me show you one more thing. Verse 19, same chapter. First Chronicles 15, 19. The musicians, He-Man, Asaph and Ethan were to sound the bronze cymbals. Zechariah, Aziel, Shemaramo, Jehiel, Unni, Eliab, Masiah, Benaiah were to play the lyres according to Alamoth, that's the music part, and Matithia, Eliphila, Miknia, Obedidam. Obedidam was also another what? He was a musician. He was a musician playing the music for the house of God. He was a gatekeeper. He was a musician. Okay, move on. Verse 23. Berechiah and Elkanah were to be the doorkeepers for the ark. Shebniah, Joshaphat, Nathanael, Amasai, Zechariah, Benaiah, Elias the priests were to blow the trumpets before the ark of God. Obed, Adam and Jehiah were also to be the doorkeepers for the ark. The gatekeepers are different, the doorkeepers are different. What a blessed privilege for Obed, Adam that he gets the job as a gatekeeper of the temple and also the doorkeeper of the ark of the covenant and he is also a musician. He moved physically from his house to come to serve the house of God. His house was on the way, his house was on the way when they took the ark of the covenant. But you know what David did? Later you will find that story. He took the ark of the covenant into the city of David later in the right way. We will see that, we have to see that part too. He took the ark of the covenant in the right way into the city of David. So now where is Obededom living now? He is now in the city of David. He is serving the Lord as a gatekeeper in the house of God. He is serving the Lord in the, as the doorkeeper in the house of God. He is serving God as a musician in the house of God. Just three months of the ark of covenant. Just three months, his life changed. The thing is, he never complained. Let me ask you a question. How many times we crib? How many times we uh, uh, complain? Our physical boss is bigger than God to us. That's what Malachi says, isn't it? Whatever you do to me, 
See the way we take God's work easy, right? Things are pending, people come late, you know, no respect for the house of God. Try to do this in your office and say, let me see. Leave the work in the middle of the, see, I've seen people, you're doing something, you'll just leave in the middle and go. Do, do it and show it to me and I challenge you. Go and leave your work in the middle and walk out of your seat and the show, let's see what happens. They'll fire you. God is a gentleman. He doesn't fire you. He gives you a long rope. He gives you a long rope. That's what Malachi says. You offer me lame goats, lame lambs. Do this to your boss and see what he will do to you. We need to be more careful about our God than that boss. Because you got a job not because of that boss. He gave you. You got children because not because of your ability. Because he gave you. And I, I, I share with every, every family I say. Never. See God gives you children. Alright. God gives you children. He gives life. After some time after the children are born. You know what happens? The children become more than God. Health issues are okay. You're not able to make it so regularly because of the child's health, we understand. But what about attitude? What about the attitude? You start glorifying and giving more importance to your child. You know how easy for God, for God it is to take away children? God forbid. Job was sitting there, he was a righteous man, upright man. You know how many children he lost in one day? Ten. Ten children in one day. He was sitting and then one person came and said there was a big storm. There was a, it fell on the building and all your children died. In one shot. Of course, Satan prompted all that. Satan did all that. God allowed it. You get it? God allowed it. God didn't do it. God allowed it. Satan to do that damage. Our life, our life itself is so frail. And what we teach to our children is what? And we want God to bless us. We want God to bless us. Do not be mocked. God says, you don't respect me, I won't respect you. That's it. You take me easy, I'll take you easy. Every day you need to pray for yourself, your family, your children. Tell me something, tomorrow you go to your office and you swipe your card and the card doesn't work. Tell me. You swipe your card to walk in and your card doesn't work. Then you'll remember God. Then you'll remember God and say, Lord, There was a king about to die. He was about to die. God said he will die. You know he turned to the wall. Let me show you this. Second Kings. Chapter 20. Second Kings. Chapter 20. And verse 3. God said. Hezekiah you are going to die. You know what Hezekiah did? Look at verse 3, or 2. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And uh, you know the story. He got how many years? 15 years of extension. My question is, do you think if we get an ultimatum right now, can we say these words, verse 3? Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. Do you think we can say this? The one reason, because there are several reasons why God blessed Hezekiah. But one of the reasons was he could say this. He could say this. Lord, you know how I lived before you. Can we really say that? 
But we want God, the, the blessings that Hezekiah got, the blessings that Obadidim got, we want those blessings, but we're not ready to make sacrifice. See, this man got his blessing. You know why? Because he loved and God blessed him so much and he loved the Lord so much that he moved and started working in the house of God. He was a gatekeeper, he was a doorkeeper, he was a musician. Now tell, let me tell you the part B. When you see a man so blessed like this, what is our impression? How do we talk about that person? Yeah? You understand what I'm saying? You see this man is so blessed. Obadidim is blessed. David came to know. Obadidim is so blessed now. I think we all need to have the attitude of David. You know what he did? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 12. This is the attitude that David had. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. Somebody came and told David, hey David, you know, this fellow was nothing. That day when all the tragedy happened three months back, we took the ark to Obed-Edom's house. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? God blessed him so much man in these three months. God blessed him abundantly, David. Verse 13. What does David do? Uh, verse 12, second part. So, David went down and brought up the ark from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of God with rejoicing. You know what David did? God is blessing you. I want that blessing. I want that blessing. He understood the secret. Ark of the Covenant is in Obed-Adam's house and God is blessing him. So he said what? I want that blessing. You remember that woman at the well? Woman at the well? Jesus said, if you drink the water I give you, you'll never thirst. She came in the middle of the day to draw water. And Jesus said, oh you came for water? I'll give you some water. And she said, you don't even have a bucket and a rope. Why, how will you give the water? Jesus said, see, the water I give you, once you taste it, you won't have to come back again and again. She said, that's exactly what I want. You know what she said? Give me that water. Give me that water. So the moment she said, give me that water, her attitude changed. She instead of becoming defensive, she started yielding. Said, give me that water. David saw Obadidim blessed. And then you know what he did? He didn't throw stones. He didn't cast aspersions. He didn't say, that fellow, oh, he must have done something. You know, it may not be God's blessing. He said, no, 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 none of that man. You know what? Is the Ark of the Covenant, that's the reason for the blessing? Then I want the Ark of the Covenant in my city. I want to be blessed. And that day, something very interesting happened. And let me put it this way, put it this way. There's a, there's a beautiful thought. An ordinary man, because of his life, could influence the king. Can you hear me? An ordinary man called Obadidim could influence the king. Wow. David said, I want, I mean, usually what we do is we try to see, when, I'm, I'm capable of buying only a small, you know, uh, $15,000 car, maybe. That is all my cap capacity. So when we see other people say, oh, they can buy big cars, you know, what we think is, you know what, I want to buy such big cars, expensive cars. Can you imagine the guy who's up there looks at this guy with a small $15,000 car and say, this great blessing in this $15,000 car, I want that. Have you ever seen like that? No. But the king is now influenced because of Obadidam and says, I want that blessing. 
we need to have that attitude. When we see God blessing some people because of their devotion to the house of God, devotion to God, you know, we need to step up and say, I want that blessing. I want that blessing. Even in the real world, this is what happens. Have you heard about a man called Chris Gardner? Chris Gardner? Chris Gardner was an ordinary man who used to uh, be a salesman selling huge, uh, you know, medical equipment. He used to sell huge medical equipment. His wife abandoned him. He raised his son in a subway bathroom. Can you hear me? He raised his son in a what was that child's bed? Toilet paper roll. This man used to take the toilet paper roll and spread it on the uh, floor of the bathroom and used to lock the door from inside and this kid used to sleep on that floor with the father sitting next to him. That is how he raised his son. One day he was walking in the downtown and he saw one guy with a Ferrari. So he came to this guy and he asked two questions. He said, what do you do and how do you do it? You hear me? What do you do and how do you do it? He told him. You know what he did? He implemented it. Chris Gardner today is a millionaire. Nelson Mandela made a private visit and he invited him all the way to South Africa to come and talk to him. Chris Gardner, look him up on Google. Look him up on Google. There's a real life story movie that was made after this man's life. In pursuit of happiness, it says. See, when the world says this and say, what do you do? How do you do? I want to follow. And if one man is getting a blessing from God and you see he's being blessed by God, why don't we come and say, hey, brother, tell me, how, how do you do this? Tell me, what do you do? I want that blessing. And when God blesses, nobody can take away that blessing. Nobody can take away that blessing. David was influenced. So now David says, I want to now bring that Ark of the Covenant. Now he corrected his mistake. And now he's bringing the Ark in the right way into the, what? City of David. I want to show you. He looks, at, he talks to the, um, uh, these people, the Levites, and he says, last time you did not do it right. Last time you did not do it right. And therefore, look at uh, First Chronicles. And 15 and verse 13. Look, uh, First Chronicles 15 and 13. He says, It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke on, out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him how about to do it, how to do it in the pres prescribed way. So we did it in the wrong way. Now what I see is, now we need to correct the mistakes. We need to bring it to the right way. How? Bring the Levites to carry the Ark of the Covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, you come back. The Ark of the Covenant is now being brought. So what did David do? What did David do? He offered sacrifices. He offered sacrifices and then he gave uh, he been big celebration that day again. So gave them uh, cakes to people, gave them lots of food to people and what he did was, he, some, he did something. Look at chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and uh, verse 16, verse 16, uh, look at verse 13. When those were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, this, he sacrificed the bull and a fattened calf. David wearing a linen ephod, linen ephod is like a, you know, the nightgown that women wear. It's like an ephod, right? Linen ephod danced before the Lord with all his might. While he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and trump sound of the trumpets. You know what's happening? Oh, this man is dancing before the ark. And from the house, his wife sees him. His wife sees him. You know what the Bible says? Verse 16. 
And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before God, the Lord, she despised him in her heart. You know what she said? She saw him dancing before the ark and she, in her heart, she said, cheap fellow. Nobody heard that. Right? Nobody heard that. In her heart she said, cheap fellow, see how stupid, like a mad fellow is dancing there. He came home. Big celebration. You know, sometimes happens, right? You know, big celebration and you come back home and you again now face the reality. He comes home, his wife says, look at verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul. It's so interesting. Wow. Look at verse 16 again. She is not called his wife. She is still termed as the daughter of Saul. <laughs> Amazing. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, it could have, she, the Bible could have said the wife, right? It doesn't even mention it as wife. Verse 20, when David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. Wow! See the language? You are no less than a vulgar fellow dancing stupid with the dress in front of all those slave girls. You know what she was more concerned about? The dignity. You know, some people when they feel too big, they don't bend. They don't humble themselves. And she was more concerned about, I think, I think that she forgot her, her dad was running after donkeys when God picked him up and made him the king. You know, when Saul became a king, you know what he was doing? He was running after donkeys because his dad says the donkeys are gone somewhere, go and look for the donkeys. He went looking for the donkeys, that's when Samuel, uh, he went to look for, took for Samuel to find out the donkeys. And God said to Samuel, Samuel, this is the fellow that you need to anoint him as a king of Israel. So, what is his original standard? He used to run after donkeys. God made him a king. And now his daughter forgot the background. Some people, you know, they forget their, you know, where they came from. She started becoming very arrogant. She looked at David and said, you vulgar fellow. She despised him in her heart and said, cheap fellow, dancing like an idiot on the roads. When you hear that, how do you respond? Yeah, when your wife says that, what do you respond? Look at verse 21. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Can we all read verse 22 together? Verse 22, all of us together. All of us together, verse 22, whatever translation you have. Let's read that together. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. You know what it says? Okay, uh, you, you call me a mad fellow, you call me a vulgar fellow. Mikal, in the presence of the Lord, I can go any further down. You are thinking of dignity? In front of God, I can go any further down. That is David. When people behave like this with the Ark of God, you know what's the result? Last verse of chapter 6. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children 
to the day of her death. She did not have children to the day of her death. Look at Obedidim and look at Mikal. Same thing called the Ark of God. 62 people blessed here because of this one man and this woman had no children till she died. You know, in, in that case we should stand up and salute uh, uh, Sarah. At the age of 90 she had a, you know, she had a son. Before, she, before you die, you know, you had a child. Wow, wonderful, Sarah. Oh, God promised me. He gave me. You see? Mikal. And story of Mikal is terrible. You will be surprised. Read what happened to Mikal's life. Terrible. Terrible things happened to her life. This is only one of them. This is only one of them. Obedidim, 62 people blessed. And here you find Michal didn't have children till she died. And David says, I'll stoop down any further before the ark. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? But this is the challenge we got. Would you do that in your life and say, God is blessing this person I want to be blessed like that. When Ebenezer Solomon came last month, we were having a discussion and he said, Chandra, do you know John MacArthur? Have you heard about John MacArthur? John MacArthur. He says, John MacArthur spends 30 hours preparing for his message. Sunday to Sunday he preaches and he, pre and he, pre and he uh, spends three zero. 30 hours for one message. No wonder God has blessed him so much, isn't it? I started making that prayer. Lord, make me like that man. I prayed like that when I was 19 years old and you had that man two weeks back here. Did you feel the Spirit of God when Deepak spoke? 19, when I was 19 I saw he said, Lord, make me like this man. I recently heard John MacArthur spends 30 hours. I prayed and said, Lord, make me like him. When we see people being blessed like this, we need to step up and say, Lord, make me like him. Ordinary man influenced King David. He said, whatever blessing you have, Obedidim, I want that blessing. Did he get it? Yes, David got the blessing. Jesus is called the son of David. God said, I will establish your house forever. Okay, did God, see, the way God blessed David over, uh, Obedidim over generations, think about this. There's some common things, you know. As God blessed Obedidim over generations, did God bless David also over generations? Yes. I will have somebody from your family sit on the throne forever, he says. There was no human at that point, but Jesus says, I am called the son of David. So what does it mean? He's there on the throne forever and ever. David, I promise you, I bless you. Several generations, God blessed him. You know, it's easy for us to listen to a good story. Tickles our ears, tickles our emotions. But we you know what we need to do? Come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to love thy house. You know the blessing this, this man had? Instead of going to the house of God, the ark of God came to his house. So his house became, you know, my professor, uh, Dr. Elmer Towns, he's the co-founder of uh, Liberty University, a great man of God. You know, he said like this, you know, when you sit in your room, you can turn that room into a sanctuary, he says. That room can turn into what? A sanctuary. His house became a sanctuary. Amen? Obed Adam's house became what? A sanctuary. Did God bless him? He moved from there. He became a gatekeeper, musician, a doorkeeper. 
And the way God blessed Obadidim, David said, I want that blessing. And God blessed him too. But there was one woman who despised. Who despised serving the Lord, humbling before God and celebrating before the Lord. What did God do to her? Till she died, it says. At least if, at least if she had a son like you know, Sarah had before she died, that's a different story. The reason I'm saying this is because when the list of the children was given, eight children, right? Eight children, in the parenthesis you find, for the Lord had blessed Obadidim. Why did he have eight children? For the Lord had blessed him. That's what the Bible says. It may not be children. It can be anything else. But when we know the secret of blessing, and we just disregard it, it's not worth it. Before we take part in the table, can we come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to love you. Love the house of God. Just like Obedidim was such a blessed man, help me to love to serve you in thy house.